pray as we come to God's Word together. Heavenly Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for this opportunity we've had to sing praises to you and speak to you. And we pray now that as you speak to us, please will you open our hearts and minds and ears and help us to hear you and to be transformed for your glory. Amen. Well, I want to take you on an imagination journey. In your minds, picture the scene. After church night, after you enjoyed the lecker supper that we're going to have tonight together, after you've had some great conversation, you head on home. And you get home, you do all your nighttime activities, and eventually you get into bed, you switch off your lights, and you drift off to sleep. Perhaps you prayed as you drifted off. In your mind, the sun is coming up tomorrow. It's going to be a normal day, horrible Monday like it always is. Um, but something, sometime during the middle of the night, you're woken by the loudest bang that you've ever heard in your life. It's not a gunshot, it's much louder than that. Then there's silence for a brief moment, and then all of a sudden, there is screaming. Ear-splitting, gut-wrenching screaming. Is it World War III? Is the world ending? You're terrified as you sit there in your bed. You feel frozen, yet somehow... Something beautiful is drawing you to go look. In the midst of the terror you hear outside, you also hear something beautiful and familiar. And so you slowly creep towards the front door. And as you do, you start to feel braver and warmer inside. As you open your doors, you, you see chaos and fires and people running around, manic and scared. But then you look up and you see a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And the sea is no more, and you see the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And you hear a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. Christ has returned. God is now with us for all eternity. The world has ended. And it brings great joy and comfort to you. Eternity with God has finally come. Don't you long for that day? I know I do. Sadly, I don't always think about it. I get distracted by this world often. But deep down, I do long for it. I yearn for it. My spirit, along with God's spirit in me, groans for it. That is the same for all Christians. We know this world is broken. It's broken by us. And we can try however hard we want to fix it. It's a bit like Humpty Dumpty. We can't put it back together again. Suffering is a reality that surrounds us every day. But as I said at the start, God doesn't hide this truth from us. So have a listen to chapter 8, verse 17 to 18 again. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with him in order that we may also be glorified with him, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. So remember from last week, our new life in the Spirit declares that we are children of God, children who are His heirs, fellow heirs with Jesus. And Paul goes on to say that we don't get the glory now. Instead, we get suffering in order that we will be glorified with Him. We live our lives now to follow Jesus. While Jesus lived here with us, his creatures, he lived a life that was marked with suffering. Philippians 2 makes that clear to us. It led Jesus to lay down his life for us. And Jesus in the Gospels, as I read earlier from Mark's Gospel, calls his followers to deny themselves, to take up their cross, and to embrace the life that Jesus calls us to. A life that embraces suffering. Suffering because, while well, we still battle with sin. Sin hasn't been dealt with. But also suffering because we follow Jesus. And that's why we battle. A life of suffering because our world is plagued with sin. But these sufferings, as Paul says, have no comparison when compared with the glory that awaits us in Christ. And God's Spirit in us, well, that He reminds us of this truth daily. And that's why we, can able, we are able to keep battling. That's why we persevere and endure. Suffering is the path that is laid before us, but it's already been walked for us by Christ. He is, he's already conquered it for us. It's all been done for us in Christ. And so we are called to share in Christ's suffering in order to share in his glory. We are called to follow Jesus, to live like Jesus, to live for Jesus because
because that day is coming soon. A day like we heard from John's vision in Revelation. A day when this heaven and earth will pass away as will suffering. A new heaven and a new earth will come with glory. And it's a day that we long for. Listen to chapter 8, verse 19 to 23. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to fertility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. So did you know that we are not the only ones longing for the new creation? The creation, the world we live in, is longing for that day too. When Adam and Eve sinned, they brought a curse upon all of creation. They cursed our world. Paul gives us this picture that is very similar to the, the fairy tales. You know, the, the cursed princess waiting for our Prince Charming to come and break the curse. In this case, we are the Prince Charming. See, all of creation is, is waiting for that day when we will be glorified as adopted sons. Children who inherit the perfect, perfected new earth. A green Planet is the latest in the BBC Planet series. They've had Planet Earth 1 and 2, Blue Planet 1 and 2, Frozen Planet, and now they have moved on to Green Planet, which, any guesses? It's all about plants. And I love nature documentaries, if you didn't know that. Our creator is just awesome. You really get to appreciate that when you stop and look at how incredibly intelligent his design is, how everything just works perfectly without anyone telling it what to do. How everything hangs in the balance. In the words of Mufasa the li- from the Lion King, the circle of life. It's a beautiful thing. I have attempted and succeeded to have a veggie garden when, I had, when we had our own garden. I love plants, but I must admit, I really hate gardening. It's hard work, and at the end of the day, you don't really have control over it. Veggie gardens are okay, because I know that I can eat it. So that's what inspires me to keep going. Uh, Beauty is not an inspiration for me. I like, I'll admire other people's uh, beautiful gardens. But plants just seem to do their own thing. They're not like animals. They don't seem to have intelligence to me. Yet after watching the green planet, I've had a change of mind. Plants are incredible. They're so intentional about every single move that they make. Our creation is God's massive garden, and He definitely orders it and maintains it. He provides exactly what is needed to sustain our planet's Uh, amazing vegetation. Yet as you reflect on this passage, this section, as mind-blowing as this creation is, Paul says it has nothing (laughs) on the new creation. That's mind-blowing to me. This creation is cursed and is suffering under brokenness and evil uh, that sin brings with it. So sin doesn't only affect us. It damages all of God's very good creation. So all of creation, along with us, that's those of us who have God's Spirit in us, groans for that day when things will be made new, when things are perfected and glorified. And Paul gives us an example of childbirth. I've never given birth, and I'm not going to ever give birth, but I do know enough, and I've heard enough to know that it's very painful. But what comes at the end? What happens when you go through all that pain and suffering? Life, a beautiful baby who is wonderfully and beautifully designed by our Creator to live in this world, is the end result. Despite all the mess that I've heard that comes with it, and the strange color that the baby comes out, uh, in the eyes of the mom and the dad, that baby is beautiful. Right, John? Yeah, he's the newest dad. (laughs) It makes those labor pains and the suffering all worth it and long forgotten. And that's our current situation as followers of Jesus as those who, as we saw last week, are spirit-filled. We groan. In the pains of labor, we long for that day where we will be made new, when we get our eternal body, when we live in a creation freed from the bondage of sin. Not only us, all of creation is waiting for that day. There couldn't be a bigger day to look forward to or to celebrate. The day our bodies are renewed and redeemed and we inherit all the earth and live in a perfect creation. I'm quite excited. Are you excited? Yeah. I won't have my shoulder injury anymore. I'll be a a new guy. uh, Let's continue in uh, Romans 8, 24 to 27. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is is seen is not hope. 
For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. For we do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. And he who searches the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. Well, this groaning and this longing is attached to the hope inside of us, hope in what is unseen. As Paul rightly says, it's not hope if we can see it. And hope is what drives us, should drive us, and keeps our minds focused on the future. But sadly, the word hope has lost its value over time. Hope is now a synonym for maybe, perhaps. And maybe, like me, you've heard many Christians tell you this before. And so intellectually you grasp this. Our hope is guaranteed. It's our reality. But like me, kind of goes in the one year and out the other year. And so quickly stop your brain from doing that. Because our hope of our future in the new creation with Christ is ours already, the Bible tells us. It will happen. And that's the thinking that needs to drive us as Christians as we patiently wait for that glorious day. Hope is not a wishy-washy cop-out from Christians. And so people shouldn't feel sorry for us because of our hope in Christ. Let me remind you of the words we heard in the first talk from Romans 5, verse 3 uh, 3 to 5. Paul says, not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that, uh, that suffering produced endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. See, hope, that kind of focused A future looking, uh, that kind of hope is the mark of a persevering Christian because suffering in this world is a reality. We know the truth and therefore we can have the right view of suffering as we wait. Uh, So many of us, uh, maybe maybe not many of us, but some of us would have heard heard of the lady called Jane Mazuski, uh, also known as Nightbird. Uh, She had over 200 million views on her YouTube after her audition on America's Got Talent. She's a young singer, writer who died this year after being diagnosed with terminal cancer that spread throughout her her body. Her spine and her liver and her lungs were clothed in tumors, yet she is our sustained Christ. She loved God and she followed Jesus, and in the midst of her suffering, severe and painful suffering, she said that she was filled with joy. That didn't mean that she ever shied away from how she felt. She was very real about her suffering and the pain that she went through. She wrote the song, It's Okay, which is the one that's on YouTube um, in the midst of this. Uh, She has a great blog, which is still up if you'd like to go read. That is very raw and real as she expresses how she feels and how how she sometimes feels towards God. She's almost like a modern day psalmist, I would say. Uh, She speaks to God. She gets frustrated with God because she loves God and she's in relationship with Him. And she's a great example of what it looks like to have this focus, to suffer well. And she gives us an example of what suffering towards our glorious future looks like. I listen to her words from one of her blogs as she reflects on her suffering and pain. She says this, But here's one thing I do know. When it comes to pain, God isn't often in the business of taking it away. Instead, He adds to it. He is more of a giver than a taker. He doesn't take away my darkness. He adds light. He doesn't spare me of thirst. He brings water. He doesn't cure my loneliness. He comes near. So why do we believe that when we are in pain, it must mean God is far? Now, how can someone who is physically and emotionally broken find these words to say? I always pray that I will be this strong uh, and have this kind of faith in the midst of that kind of crushing news. In the face of no answers, I pray for that strength. The incredible comfort from this passage tonight is that God says, We all have that. God's Spirit is in us. See, that wasn't Jane's strength alone. That was God's powerful Spirit at work in Jane's life because she had God's Spirit in her. Her mortal body was feeble and weak, but the day is coming where she'll be transformed. No more cancer, no more chemo. She was able to be strong in the midst of her suffering. She was filled with joy rather than bitterness because she is a son of God, an inheritor. She is a child of God filled with hope. This world and everyone in it could not change that truth for her. And I pray that none of us will ever have to endure such intense suffering in this world. But it is a reality. 
one we mustn't shy away from. Suffering is not something we are called to run away from as Christians or to pretend that it doesn't exist or it doesn't happen. It's not something that we try and ignore. No, we endure. We embrace it, knowing that it leads to glory in Christ. When we are broken and beat down, remember this truth. We have God's Spirit in us. He groans just like us for the new creation. And when we don't have the words, when we can't say what we want or how we can't express how we feel, the great news is God's Spirit is doing that for us. I often feel that He must be working overtime for me. I'm not very good at expressing myself. And so these verses bring extra comfort to me. They bring great comfort for all of us. God's Spirit shares our deepest concerns with God. He speaks for us. And that is a great thing. It is a good thing that God does for us as we head into our last section of this uh, passage, uh, verse 28 to 30. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose, for those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to, con- to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. Now verse 28 is probably one of the most quoted verses of God's word and sadly one of the most misquoted verses. The prosperity gospel preachers love this verse. For those who love God, all things work together for good. God doesn't want you to be sick. He doesn't want you to be poor or to struggle and to suffer. Show your faith by giving to the church. What a lot of nonsense. If someone tells you that, tell them to go read God's word. To read the gospel of Christ. Or even just to read this chapter properly in its context as we've already seen. Suffering is not shameful. And it is not always God's judgment on us. As we have already seen, we no longer face condemnation. We are sons, adopted children, inheritors of God our Father, fellow heirs with Christ our brother. We will share in Jesus' glory, but not now. That's for the future. And so now we live like Christ. As Paul says in his letter to the Philippians, to live now in this present age is Christ, suffering, perseverance, endurance. To die is gain, future glory for eternity. Christians endure suffering now because they are filled with the hope of future glory. That's the truth. That's the life that God calls us to while we wait. That is his purpose. Look at verse 29. Those God foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. The good that God is working for us is to mold us and to shape us to look more like Jesus. God loves us. He deeply loves us and he sends Jesus Christ, his son, to die for us, to rescue us, reconcile us and redeem us. God, the Holy Spirit, is poured into us to make us aware of that love. God, the Holy Spirit, helps us to live in this truth, to battle sin and in so doing, to look more and more like our brother, Jesus. We start to look more like our new identity as children of God, our creator. When Adam and Eve, the original image bearers, chose to sin against God, to live their own way, to make themselves God, our image was broken. We could no longer reflect our loving creator to the world because love had been replaced with selfishness and hate and pride. In Christ, our image is being restored through the work of the Spirit. So we endure suffering and continue to battle our sin. And as we strive to say no to the things that displease God, as we believe God more uh, than we do ourselves and the world around us, well, we start to look more like Jesus, our King. We start to share with the world who God is, what He is like. And so our image starts to get restored. And God is doing an incredible work in us, brothers and sisters. He's, he's changing us and He's growing us to be like His precious Son, Jesus, who was perfect in every way. His plan to achieve this has always been through suffering, which came into the world as a result of our rebellion. Brothers and sisters, we are different to those around us. Suffering doesn't define us or break us. We don't run away from suffering. We don't fear suffering because God is working for our good. Through suffering, God is doing something beautiful in us. And this passage tells us that God has known us. He's known you and me before we ever existed. We have been predestined. I know this word causes a lot of argument and uh, maybe strikes some fear into you. 
Why does God choose some and not others? I don't want us to be distracted by that. Um, so you can come talk to me afterwards if you have some questions about it. I don't claim to have the answer, but I can chat to you. But I do want to say this, that predestination is always used in the positive in God's word. It's never used to exclude people. It's always spoken to those who are included as a comfort, as a reminder that it's not an accident that we belong to God. And I also want to add that predestination doesn't exclude our free choice that God has given us. God has given us the choice to choose him, and predestination doesn't change it. Otherwise, why else would he say, why would God need to call us after he's already predestined us in verse 30? But the point is this, God is in control, and he always has been and always will be. Before creation, before we existed, God had this plan all worked out. Brothers and sisters, the great thing to think about and to reflect on tonight is that he had you and me in mind before time even existed. He laid out our lives for us. He knew suffering would come to us because he knew it would be good for us. Like many things in this life that cause pain and suffering are good for us. We train hard when we want to do well in sport. We practice hard when we want to do well in our uh, music or whatever other things. Uh, we go on hikes, which are beautiful, but also hard and tough. In childbirth, as we've seen, uh, we undergo surgery, which we know is going to be horrible, but it'll be good for us. Education can be a slog at times, but it's good for us, and the list can go on. Our suffering now, longing for eternity, is no accident. And so it has purpose, it's good for us, it focuses us, and it keeps our eyes on our great God. It reminds us of this amazing truth. The God of the universe has chosen us, little old us. He chooses us way before we choose him. He calls us out of our mess, and he makes it as though we've never wronged him. And then he gives us glory. Our Father in heaven, who has all the glory and deserves all the glory, gives us, brother and sisters, his children, glory. Let's live with eternity in our eye line. Let's be hope-filled people who keep pushing forward because we have a glorious future ahead. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank you and we praise you for your word. We thank you for the glorious news that you are with us, even in the midst of suffering and pain, that you told us this, and that it has a purpose. It's not a random thing. It's something that makes us look more like your son, Jesus Christ. Something that we are called to, to endure as we head to glory in eternity with you forever not always easy to remember this truth in the midst of suffering and so we pray that you will remind us as we groan as your spirit inside of us intercedes for us and please will you help us as brothers and sisters to remind each other of this truth in a loving way to to have ears that are open to care for those um, help us to keep our eyes on you to keep our eyes on our future to not fall for the lies of this world to not hide from suffering, but to embrace it because we know that we are heading to glory with you forever. That a day is coming when this creation will be renewed and restored as will our bodies. Thank you for this great news, Heavenly Father. Amen. Mm -hmm.